ASU students, Josh here. Um, you just finished three weeks, or the first three weeks, and are in the news series. And the last two weeks, we wanted to talk and have a conversation on race. And over the past six, seven months or so, uh, there just really has been a lot of racial unrest and racial tension popping up in the world. And we, as a student ministry staff, wanted to engage in that conversation with you guys and bring a biblical perspective to a conversation going on in your friend circles, in your homes, on the news, in school see what God has to say about racial um, injustice, racial reconciliation, and what it means to stand up for God's people. And so um, just as a little disclaimer here, we filmed this conversation back in August, so things might have changed a little bit in the world since then. Um, also, Cedric, Rich, and I, we're bringing our own perspectives, our own thoughts, and our own feelings for this conversation. So this doesn't reflect everything um, that everyone views on everything. It's not, we're not speaking on behalf of all people, but we did want to start and have this conversation. And we just encourage you that tonight, after you listen to this conversation, that you're able to have your own conversations in your groups tonight. Uh, I ask and I pray that you guys have grace for us in our conversation, that you have grace for one another and your leaders in this conversation tonight, and that ultimately we just we want you to have an open dialogue about a very, very important topic in our nation today. And so as you go forward in conversations tonight, just keep in mind that um, everyone's coming into this, pers into this conversation with different perspectives, and um, let's just look to listen to each other well tonight and to see what is God doing in the midst of this conversation. Well, students, here we go. We're, we're going to dive into some conversation here, and hopefully you'll be encouraged by it, you'll be enlightened, and uh, hopefully you'll have some great discussion following it. But uh, you already heard from Josh in the intro, so Josh Jacobs, you are, your role is? Junior high small groups. Sure, and I'm Rich, and uh, same thing, only high school. So high school small groups is is where I where I sit most of the time, but we have Dr. Cedric Williams with us. And uh, so Cedric, you're a friend. Uh, I was trying to think how long we've known each other. It's been 15 or 16 15, years, yeah, but 15 years. Um, let me just tell a little bit about you because okay. you got some awesome stuff, at least I think so, and they're going to think so too. So you're you're a Bloomington Normal resident. You're a, you're a townie, right? Yeah, and Raider Nation. Raider Nation, so, so BHS. Um, we got a few Bloomington students. Okay, all right, right, right on. And so I'm sure they, they're, they're purple proud. Is that yeah. even what you guys are? I don't, I don't know. I don't know what they're these guys, but who knows. Yeah. But uh, graduated from Illinois State. Yeah. You also went on to Lincoln Christian Seminary, mm -hmm. eventually on to the Fuller Theological Seminary. Yes. And so with that, that's that's part of the angle you're going to bring to the discussion. Now you're going to bring the psychological, mm -hmm. the psychologist view. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that's that's uh, that's the angle you're going to bring to a lot of the discussion tonight. Sure. So in addition to that, um, some of the some of the students, probably most of the students, are going to hear this. They have no idea that you were on staff here back in the day. You yeah, back worked with day. our young adults back when yeah. the young adults ministry was called Fuel. Yeah. And uh, and actually, you worked with uh, some of the guys who were in that ministry. I'm actually going to reference later. So Brandon Grant, and Tony Calabrese. I'll, I'll mention their names later in yeah. some discussion. But um, and that's. That feels like a long time ago, but it's not. Yeah, that it long feels ago. like a long time. Was, uh, so, in addition to that, and so uh, this is pretty cool. You you served in our military. You were an Army Ranger, or are an Army Ranger? Is that something that's hey, been past tense? Yeah, no, it's fine. Uh, Ranger qualified. Went to Ranger school a okay. while ago. Okay. Yeah, I've been doing. Uh, just reached a little over eighteen years in the Army, so okay. I was active duty for a long time, and then I switched over to the reserves and. So yeah, so thank you for serving. Thank you. Um, Appreciate it. So let's let's fast forward a little bit. So today. Uh, you currently have started leading uh, the Legacy Consulting and Research Group, yeah. and uh, you actually have a few people working with you now. I've seen some some yeah. introductions, and mm -hmm. so so that's cool. Uh, you're also doing some some work with our local police and fire departments. Yeah, that's um, through Legacy. Through the that's through Legacy. Legacy. Okay, yeah. cool. Uh, and this is probably the most important. But you you're also a father. Yeah. Uh, you have two awesome kids, very <laughs> cute kids, and, and I got to hang out with them just last weekend. Or last so weekend. Yeah. So yeah. Um, Justice and Jazzy May, your yep. son and daughter, mm -hmm. uh, but also your husband to your wife Hannah. Hannah, who you guys just celebrated an anniversary, right? Twelve years. Twelve years. Congrats on yeah. that. So yeah. that's that's awesome. But uh, and so I don't think I missed anything. But I just I wanted I wanted to talk about that stuff because yeah, if I'm a young sure. man or if I'm a young woman or if I'm an old man, um, <laughs> I'm interested in what you have to say because of because I'm of who you are. <laughs> yeah, whatever. I'll be, I'll be like 50 soon. Yeah, it's gonna happen. Yeah, I think gonna, unless I get the Rona. Oh, we, we got some repairs there. But anyway, um, so Josh, where, where are we headed in this discussion? Yeah. So Cedric, I just want to start the conversation off yeah. and talk about maybe your personal experiences uh, with 
racism, racial tension in our country, and talk maybe about what your day-to-day -day experience has been like, what your experience as a junior high and high school student was like, or anything you think that would be important to share um, with our junior high and high school students. Yeah, I, I, you know, when we were talking about this, I, I, I think that um, throughout the lifespan, I've dealt with racism, issues of race, racial inequalities. I think that um, for being a, a, a black male, that is something that is, it is not an anomaly, you know, um, that this is a part of a lived experience. So I can think of my earliest childhood memory of dealing with racism, actually it was in the church. Um, uh, I had a Sunday school teacher uh, sing a song and eeny meeny miny mo grab a N word by the toe. She was talking to my brother and I in class and I can remember as a, as a kid of knowing that that was wrong. I knew it was wrong, um, and I remember the kind of the cognitive dissonance of sitting in class or, or sitting in Sunday school, you know, with the teacher, hearing about the love of Christ. But she, she just said that. Um, fast forward, you know, I, I told my parents. We told my parents, and the lady came over our house, like you know, later on in that week, and was you know, she was beside herself in, in, in tears. You know, sorry, but. Um, it was just one of those things where you never forget that I'm 36 years old and still talk about that, you know, because it was it was such a formative memory. Um, I can remember being in uh, playing local football, you know, here in uh, the junior football league. I played for like the Fighting Irish, and, um, and it was around. I don't know if it's still around, but um, I can remember traveling, and um, uh, I was in a, another another city, and I remember like I was getting tackled, and uh, they were hitting me, and calling me the N word. Like literally, I was play, I played running back, so you know it was it was happening a lot, um, and I, I just was so it was disturbing, you know to say the least. I can remember in high school, uh, one of the memories that feels like you know really heavy is I can remember going over to a uh, a friend's, getting picked up from a friend's and going to a new friend's house, and then when we got there, um, you know we weren't allowed to come in, um, and the young lady said you know like my my dad doesn't allow black people. Sorry, you guys can't come in, or you can't come in. Um, and so, you know, my friends had to make a decision at that point. You know, do we, and do do we stay because, you know, Cedric, like, a, you know, what are you, what are you gonna do, or you know, like, um, and it was just one of those experiences that's so painful. Like, you know, being a an adolescent uh, and a teenager and having to deal with something like that. Um, yeah, and I, I feel like that those are some of the the memories, you know, of, you know, being a, a kid, being an adolescent, being in junior high, high school. Today, it's a little bit more sophisticated, you know, as far as my, uh, it's more subtle, it's more, um, what I would call racial microaggressions, where it's, you know, people devaluing your work, whether it be, you know, as an academic, devaluing you as, um, you, you know, your thoughts as being somebody who's speaking out against racial injustice. Um, so I, I think that it's a little bit more subtle mm -hmm. now. It's a more sophisticated, especially in a community like limited normal. Most people are not um, explicitly racist, not, you know, saying I'm part of the KKK or saying the N word. Um, but it's more, it's more subtle. It's more exclusion. It's more um, isolating. It's more um, diminishing mm -hmm. um, who you are as a human being. So I, I think that when people think about racism, they typically think about these socially unacceptable things like KKK and, you know, saying the N-word, but there's a lot of things that are underneath the surface that are very socially acceptable that people do um, that are also what I would consider as racial behaviors. Yeah, I've, I've heard those stories before, and I'm, I'm, still, I'm still surprised. I guess I'm very disappointed. I'm very disappointed, but I'm, I'm surprised that that's in what feels like me such recent history. I mean that's that's 30 years ago. You were in Sunday school, maybe not even quite. And yeah, I mean, probably 26 or 7 years ago when you were in JFL playing football. Mm -hmm. um, and the Irish are still around, although I think they've canceled their their fall season due to the Rona, yeah. unfortunately. But yeah. they are still around. Yeah. Um, let, let me let me kind of turn the topic a little different direction, here, Cedric. I, I heard I've heard lots of interviews and conversations you've had lately, and uh, and we've had conversations lately. But sure. uh, one in particular, you were you were visiting with Tony Calabrese, who's yeah. a longtime friend. Tony's yeah. a former former guy, former pastor. Here. Um, yeah. yeah. He recently started a new church in the Nashville area. Yeah. 
Radiant, Radiant, Radiant Church. I don't know why I can't remember yeah, that. Yeah. That's a, Radiant Church in Nashville. Mm -hmm. um, but in that conversation, Tony specifically asked you, how can we, how can we make an impact of re reconciliation moving forward? And, and in your answer, um, you responded very quickly went to scripture. And the scripture you took us to came from, I think it's in all four gospels, but it's, it's when Jesus is asked, what are the two greatest commandments? And his answer is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind. Um, but then love other people as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And, and you went on to challenge us to ask ourselves in, in your response, who do you consider your neighbor? Who do you consider, maybe I heard this, maybe you said it, you said, who do you consider people? Who do you consider your neighbor? And that hurt because it needs to be said because there are still people in modern day USA who don't look at their neighbors as equals, who don't look at other people mm -hmm. as equals. And, and, and so that, that bothered me. Mm -hmm. not, not that you shouldn't have said it. It was definitely valid and needed to be said. But um, I, I'm curious, uh, are, are there still things happening today that, that, may, that may come with good intentions yet still feel demeaning or even suggest inferiority? And, and I asked that question, and, and I actually want to want to give you just my spin on that, something I also heard. You you mentioned in a conversation, I think this was Brandon Grant, former ECU guy who's now in San Diego, who you were out near mm -hmm. uh, for, for years. But um, in that conversation, I believe you had spoken at a venue. It may have been at Eastview. It may not. I don't remember that. But mm -hmm. after after speaking, someone came up and commented that, they, I don't know if they enjoyed your speech, uh, but they commented you were very articulate. I was going to say they enjoyed your speech, but I don't guess you said that. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. They yeah. probably did. Mm -hmm. I would have enjoyed it. Uh, but, but they said you were very articulate. And I think there might have been some ill will in that comment. At least it sounded perceived as that. The, the perception was you were very articulate for a black man. Mm -hmm. I hear that, and, and I think to myself, all right, I, I might be guilty of that. Mm -hmm. I might not be guilty of the intent behind it, but I might be guilty of saying that. I, I might say that to you at some point because, quite honestly, I feel like you are a very articulate speaker. But mm -hmm. you are very articulate, period, for a man, a person. Mm -hmm. And so I ask myself, what, what, what other things happen on a daily basis that might be, might be good-hearted but still come across as offensive? Because I know stuff happens. Right. What are we doing that's still offensive? Well, I think that, you know, let, let me uh, uh, back up for a second. I think that, like, you know, in the conversation talking about, that, that person saying it's not an isolated incident like you know I've had sure. multiple times where people have said oh man you're so articulate well this is what and they're I, saying that almost surprised you're articulate for a black man I'm so, yes and that's why I think where implicit bias comes in where when you look at TV or you look at the media there's a portrayal of what a black person looks like sounds like acts like behaves you know all of those types of things. And so when somebody comes in and gives a speech or talk or we're having a dialogue discussion, there's, and I sound the way that I sound, I am black, I talk like a black person, right? Because I am black. Um, when somebody says, oh wow, you are, you sound so articulate, as if they are surprised by what I sound like or what I talk like or the discussion or where we're carrying the conversation. What I think is happening in there is that historically we have been conditioned to believe this is what this person looks like. This is what this person sounds like. This is what this person dresses like. This is what this person listens to. This is the type of music. All of those things are have, have been conditioned. And so when I say, I don't think that there's a lot of people um, when they go into job interviews or talks that somebody comes up and says, man, you're so articulate. I think they usually say, it was a really good speech, period, right? So when somebody says you're articulate, it doesn't feel, it might be great intentions. It might be perfect intentions, right? But people do not judge you on your intentions. They, they judge you off of the embodied lived experience with them. Right, so you can have great intentions and still say something that could be uh, uh, perhaps um, uh, you know un uninformed or misinformed. Sure. So that's what I would say to that. Sure. Uh, 
are there other big things that happen repeatedly that, that kind of fall in that same line of? Well, I, th I think that I think that you know, uh, going on along the lines of you know, especially being a black male, I think that as I said, there's a social conditioning that happens where people believe that this is what you look like, this is what you sound like, um, and then when you do something otherwise, um, uh, I. It, it's you know it feels surprising like we we are not a threat I'm not a threat I have a family I have a life I'm not a, I'm not a threat you know um, I have children I'm a father I, I mow my grass you know I listen to music I lay down you know like all of those I mean, a human being just like you and I, I know it's it's funny it sounds funny but these I, are the I things that we have to actually communicate to people because it feels like a lot of people don't use, use were viewed as other, mm -hmm. were viewed as different, were viewed as, you know, uh, strange, or too mm -hmm. loud, too this, not mm -hmm. professional, mm -hmm. you know, we're not, we're not this, and we're just, uh, you know, you're categorizing people repeatedly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is really problematic. Um, and I think that we see that in high school, in junior high, I mean, I, I remember being in junior high and high school and feeling like, you know, um, uh, people would ask, you know, oh, are, are, you, are you an athlete? Mm -hmm. uh, well, yes, but, but why do you assume that I'm, I'm just an athlete, you know? Or, like, what is it about you, what you have learned on TV that says that this is what you are? Um, and I think that that just needs to be expanded. Like, we're human beings like every single person. Picking back off of that a little bit, I think there is, um, in our current culture and context, a phrase that, um, that has been used um, for many years now, Black Lives Matter. And to your point, um, there are times when people say things, and they might have well intentions, um, but they might be not really understanding the full, um, full power of what they're saying. And so you have this issue where people say Black Lives Matter, but then you have this other agenda coming through where it's like, no, all lives matter. We can't say black lives matter because that just highlights one group, but all lives matter as Christ followers. We believe all people are created in the same image. But what would you say to someone who has that, maybe that frame of mind, or what would you, why would you say it is important to be a people who do promote black lives matter in, in this certain time and experience? So what I, what I would say to that is that black lives matter, period. Pause. I also believe that all lives matter. In order for all lives to matter, black lives have to matter as well. Historically, in our American context, black lives have been marginalized, have been on the outside, right? We are setting aside a time in history to say black lives matter because historically that has not been the case with our actions and our behaviors, whether on an individual level or on a societal level. So I think that when people say, oh, well, it's either black lives matter or all lives matter, it's like, no, like, I believe that black lives matter, period. And I believe that all lives matter, period. But when I say unapologetically that Black Lives Matter, it's saying that I am really trying to hone in on what is happening now in our current context. I kind of think about it like this, like, you know, um, uh, we do, uh, we have all different types of like cancer awareness, you know, like mm -hmm. we do lots of cancer awareness things like, you know, breast cancer, lung cancer, uh, colon cancer, all different types of cancers. And we have like, you know, hey, this is really important. Can you imagine if during Breast Cancer Awareness Month, the NFL has that, you know, and there's a lot of speeches, there's a lot of money raised, and all of a sudden, during a breast cancer awareness, the speaker gets up and says, you know, breast cancer is so very important, and we want to set aside this time and say, you know, breast cancer, and then somebody stands up and says, hey, what about, what about all cancer? All cancer matters. That's ridiculous. All cancer should matter. Well, of course, sir or ma'am, like, of course we believe that all cancer matters, but we are setting aside breast cancer awareness and saying breast cancer matters in this moment and we're raising funds and we're drawing attention um, in order to build research, in order to have funding, you know, in this specific time. If you take that same type of 
uh, you know, analogy, and you put it towards, you know, Black Lives Matter, it's not to say that all lives don't matter. We're just saying that we have to set aside some time in history, in our American history, and not even just American history, but global history, to say Black Lives Matter, because historically, they have been, um, we have been marginalized mm -hmm. in communities. And so that would be my response of why I say Black Lives Matter um, and hold to that. That's very centric. And then I guess piggybacking off of that a little bit too, do you see any other ways that as a society or even in circles that you are in um, where people use other, maybe other issues or other, um, other organizations or movements or things that happen that we can see on TV and they use that to try and divide the issue rather um, than talking about the issue of racial inequality and maybe Black Lives Matter in general? Yeah, I would, you know, and to that, I would just say, uh, you know, uh, some of the other churches that I've met with and talked to, I said, keep the main thing the main thing, mm -hmm. right? So there's always going to be other things that distract and that are paired in order to uh, diminish and to invalidate the main point. Mm -hmm. The main point is that we are saying that racial inequality is, is, an, is a concern. As a Christian, I don't think that it's just a concern, uh, a societal concern. I think that this is a this is a humanity concern. So to me, it's an issue of sanctification and spiritual formation. As somebody who's growing in your love for Christ, in your love for the church, in your development as a Christian, these issues of multicultural competence, of, of racial reconciliation, are a progression, right? It's a movement. The more that you grow as a leader, the more that you have influence as a human being, the more focused you are into how do I expand my love as a Christian for my community, you know, my neighbor, at an individual level, at a societal level. So Cedric, um, when looking to scripture, do you see yeah. any examples or themes or uh, passages that really stand out to you when we talk about um, this issue of racial inequality and um, trying to address racism in our country? Yeah. Yeah, I think that there's a, a, a couple of scriptures that come to mind when I, when I think of, um, and I, I don't know if it's just racial inequality. I think of just inequality, yeah. just in, in general, and being able to have access to to Jesus and love and to be community. Um, yeah. The couple of things that come to mind are in Acts, uh, I think it's Acts 16 with Paul and Silas when they're jailed. Um, Jesus when he's clearing the temples. Um, specifically not just clearing the temples, but clearing the court of the Gentiles because the court of the Gentiles was being uh, squeezed out. So Gentiles were already on the outsides. And it, even more so, you know, when the money changers and, you know, people were marketing there. And so they're, they're squeezing even more of the Gentiles out, which is a disparity issue, right? Um, but the one that, the scripture that I feel like continues to come up or has come up in the last month that I've been thinking and reading about is... Um, in Luke 5, right? So when Jesus is in, um, in, in the house and there's four friends that are lowering um, an injured, injured person, right? And so they're literally ripping the roof off, right? And in order to be able to lower their friend down, their neighbor down, or who may, I don't know if that's their friend, you know, it might just be a neighbor, yeah, it might be somebody, yeah, I mean, there's four of them, you know, yeah. so maybe a friend of one, you know, who knows, or two or three, um, but nonetheless, the point is, when I, when I think about racial inequality, when I think about racial reconciliation, that is a picture that has come in my mind, mm -hmm. of like, how do we as Christians are, are the people who are removing barriers mm -hmm. for us to be able to have community with one another? to have that exposure, to be able to say like, not in a, like a savior way, mm -hmm. but as a friendship way of like, man, like this is important. And if there's barriers and, and somebody's hurting and there's an opportunity to have community and to be close to God um, and to be able to experience this together, they might've been able to experience Jesus otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. But we get to experience Jesus together in this way, together, this yeah. unison. Um, I, I think that that's a beautiful picture of what we as a church, mm -hmm. as students, as human beings, um, you know, can do of like, hey, look, like, how are we ripping up barriers in order to provide access um, for all people mm -hmm. to experience love and community with one another?
That's very nice. These few students, you just listened to part one of a two-week conversation that we're having on race in our small groups. And again, I just ask you guys to have grace for one another in your conversations tonight, to listen well, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and just engage in some great dialogue tonight. So have a great time in your small groups tonight, and pray that your discussion goes well.